Hey everyone, Bruce Eckfeld here. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications so we can let you know when the next video is posted. You can also check us out at Eckfeld.com for more great content. With that, let's go check out the video. You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. Our guest today is Corey Kupfer, and Corey is an attorney, he's an entrepreneur, and he's an author. The book is Authentic Negotiating, and we're going to hear a little bit about his story. We're going to talk about the book. We're going to learn, hopefully, a little bit about how to be a better, more successful negotiator. Corey, welcome to the program. Bruce, it's so great to be here with you. Yeah. You know, I always like to start with the background. So you've been an attorney, you've been an entrepreneur. Let's talk about that, and then we can talk a little bit about the book. How did all this start for you? You know, I've been an entrepreneur since I'm 15, and I say that not like I had the the paper roots and the, you know, <laughs> cutting grass and the snow yeah. and snow before that. But, but I literally had my first business with employees, although they weren't on the right kind of payroll, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but they worked for me, uh, at, you know, at, at age 15, I, uh, I used to deliver flyers door to door in Brooklyn when I grew up. So, you know, like yeah. the supermarket circulars or whatever, you know, back in the days when they actually printed things and, you know, yeah, they, exactly. uh, yeah. and, um, you know, I, I did that working for a company and they would pay me a penny a piece, you know, and sometimes we were really lucky yeah. we would get to deliver two different companies flyers at the same time. Ooh, and then you get a yeah. penny and a half because nice. So I, I would stop on on the route while I was working for someone else in the local stores. And I would say, hey, you know, we deliver flyers. If you need a, somebody to deliver flyers, we can do it. And I got my own accounts and I hired my friends. And, and uh, you know, we, we, I had a flyer delivery business when I was 15. Early hustle. I love the early hustle. <laughs> <laughs> so then how did you get into law? Like what was the, what was the yeah. decision to get into to law, become an attorney? Yeah. So, you know, so it was interesting. I mean, I, I sort of came from, you know, the classic Jewish family, not that it, this is exclusive to, to Jewish families, but yep. in, you know, in, in my culture, you know, where you uh, go to school, you, you know, go to college, you go to grad school of some sort, you get a job and you work for somebody and you make, you know, and you make a good living, hopefully yeah. and you're a doctor or a lawyer or, a, you know, uh, whatever. One, one of the limited um, choices that I think most people <laughs> coming out of those cultures kind of have in terms of professions. Exactly. Yeah. But for me, for me, it was different because a lot of people sort of get stuck into that and it's not what they really wanted to do. Yeah. In my parents' master plan, uh, because I was not a very <laughs> forward looking kid yeah. at all. I was not a forward looking kid. I mean, I just sort of, you know, I was a reasonably bright kid. I did well in school without having to work super hard. I was more interested in hanging out with my friends and then, you know, girls as I got older yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But my parents were smart enough to sort of guide me and, you know, grew up in Brooklyn and there was a special program at Tilden High School, which was the school I was zoned for. Uh -huh. But it, it was a law, politics, and community affairs program. They called it LPC. Oh, interesting. And, okay. and my parents said, you should do this. And they sort of signed me up for it. You know, I didn't really know what it was. I wouldn't have done it without them. And I got into it. You know, we would do, I mean, it's interesting, parts of law that I just don't do now, but it got me interested in it. So, like, we would do mock trials, and we would yeah. go visit prisons, and we would go visit, you know, go, and then we had a mock presidential election, and I, you know, and I was one of the candidates, and I won. <laughs> and, yeah. So, yeah. So I think that got me hooked. So going into college, unlike a lot of people who go, frankly, to law school or to you know business school for their MBA or whatever, and it's sort of the next natural step because they're pretty smart and they don't know what they want to do and they'll mm -hmm. go get more education. I actually came into college knowing I wanted to be a lawyer. Of course, in hindsight, I had no idea what that really meant. Yeah. But for whatever yeah. reason, I, I had it in my head that I wanted to be a lawyer. And I went through through college uh, you know, with the intention of going to law school. Yeah. Well, and I think law, you know, is one of those interesting degrees that it applies to so many things. I mean, every facet of business, every industry, you know, every kind of part of those things has some kind of legal aspect. So I think it's actually a great training, you know, regardless of if you're going to practice law formally or not. It's a good training. It's a good training on thinking about how to think, how to kind of organize things, how to create solutions, how to think through the details. So I... I think that's a great setup, I think, for anyone going into kind of the general business community. But you actually chose to practice law, right? So you, you went from there into law practice? Yeah, so, so I did. I, you know, I went straight, you know, college, law school, job. I came out in the 80s from a very good law school. So I had like my choice of, you know, 14, nice. 18 yeah. jobs, whatever. You know, and I did that typical path. But I sort of... I always had in the back of my mind that I didn't want to work for somebody f for the rest of my yeah. life. And, and I, I didn't have any models for it because my parents were both employed. You know, they, they weren't entrepreneurs. But there was something about me, like from day one, the politics and the FaceTime and the the BS just, yeah. uh, you know, I, I didn't take to it well. I mean, I could I knew how to play the game. I could play the game, but it just wasn't authentic to who yeah. I was. 
And um, so literally like less than six years, uh, about six years out of school, I left a uh, big law firm practice. I hung out a shingle. I had no clients. The firm I was with had long-term institutional clients and they weren't going anywhere. And it was, yeah. it was actually, uh, you know, late 91 when I announced in the 90, early 92 when I started. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a recession. People, you know, yeah. may not remember or may not be old enough or whatever, but it was a recession. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and uh, so everybody told me I was crazy. You know, I was I was uh, making I was about to get a raise. I think it was, you know, to over six, you know, to yeah. make a hundred some thousand, which in 1992 was a good money, but it was a hell of a lot of money back yeah. then. And um, and everybody told me I was crazy. What are you doing? How you yeah. you know you have this great job? You have no clients. You're I applied for several credit cards above the ones I had. It was paying my rent on credit cards. I did everything you weren't supposed to do. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, this is not the advice just, portion of the program. <laughs> no, no, this is not the advice. Well, you know, well, it is and it isn't yeah. because frankly, frankly, I think if you have if you have a dream and you have the passion to go for it, and you're willing yeah. to take the risk. And listen, I was single at the time. I had no family yeah. to worry about. Yeah. Whatever. So I, I had parents who loved me. I could always go back and live yeah. with them if I had to. Like, like the truth is, you know, I, I mean, I got to be honest. Yes, was it a big risk? Could have it yeah. failed? But I mean, my safety net compared to the risk that a lot of other people who really have real risk in their lives was, you know, yeah. was, uh, you know, I would have been fine. I would not have been homeless. Yes, yes, exactly. But so that, that got you starting your own practice, I'm sure. So what were the biggest challenges about that? You mentioned you didn't have any clients. You mentioned that, you know, you're just kind of starting out with nothing. Like, what did you learn, I guess, you know, in the, in the, yeah. in the pursuing, you know, months and years about how to actually start professional practice? Because that's, you know, it, it's not easy. Well, listen, the first word that comes to mind is hustle. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I mean, and I know it's sort of an overused word and whatever, but Frankly, that was the one thing I had. I, I mean, I had I had some connections, but not, you know, like I, I didn't come from money. I didn't come from a background like that. I had made some professional connections. But, you know, in the legal business, when you're, you know, six years out of school, that's not that long, especially yeah. for the type of stuff I was doing. You know, I, I was doing big corporate contractual deals, M&A, that kind of stuff. So the kind of clients I had wasn't like, and I'm not disparaging any of the other areas of law, but it's a little different if you're in sort of in a consumer individual practice yeah. area. When I first thought of my firm, I did what I needed to do. So I actually did. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I, I did some bankruptcy. <laughs> I did some landlord tenant. I did some, uh, you know, I mean, I did a marital thing. I mean, I, I don't even, you know, and, and I was calling my friends because I had no idea what I was doing, but I, yeah. but I always knew I would figure it out. But, you know, but the intention was, and quickly, frankly, you know, after about a year, I was able to, about a year and a half, yeah. I brought in a partner because I was able to get back to doing what I really wanted to do. But the point was, so I, I, I had, so it took a lot of hustle. I was at every networking event that existed. I mean, yeah. in every state in the tri-state area. I mean, I, one of my long-term clients now who is about to sell his third company is a guy I met at a networking event in Stanford, Connecticut, or Greenwich, Connecticut, one yeah. of those, right? And it was just some random thing because I just went if it, if, if there were going to be people there and it was a network I went to. Yeah. I also uh, I also signed up. There was some of these um, union legal plans. So the, the teachers oh, that's uh, union had a legal plan, and they would uh, send you. You could get on the panel or on the list, yeah. and then they would send you referrals. And I remember back then, I think uh, most of my friends were charging 150, 175 an hour at like my level, you know, back then. And they were paying $65 an hour. And my friends from the big firms and, you know, said to me, why are you working for $65 an hour when your billing rate is like 175? Yeah. Like, no, no, you don't understand the math. My choice is not between 175 and 65. <laughs> my choice is between zero, zero and 65. 65. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, for, for a lot of my time, that was, you know. So well, the, you know, look, I think if, if it's a consistent referral source and you don't have to do a whole lot of work selling it otherwise, it's not bad. I mean, the, you know, the 175 always builds in, you know, for every hour that you're billing, you're spending two hours, you know, trying to get that hour. So No question. Yeah. They, they, was, they were sending me business. It helped me, you know, yeah. get established. It helped me, you know, I ended up getting referrals from those people. I became one of the top two referral attorneys in New York City on that plan. Yeah. And then, you know, a couple of years later, I think I started phasing it out, frankly, uh, like two years later, because yeah. we had gotten so busy with other stuff. But it was a great way to start. And Listen, my motto was, so it was hustle, but then the other big thing was, you know, listen, this is, <laughs> this is a little scary, but I was willing to say yes to business, even if I did not know how to do it. Yeah. But here's the key thing, because I think you can go to an extreme on this and run yourself into trouble. Yep. It wouldn't have been, in, so what I, what I said was, I don't need to know how to do it now to say yes, but I need to be confident I could figure it out by the time I needed to do it for somebody because yeah. I wasn't willing not to do a great job. So yeah. my test was, will I, will I be able to know it by the time I have to do it, not do I know it now? 
<laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Can so, I learn it? Know, can I learn it fast enough to do? Can I learn uh, it fast enough to do to, a good job to deliver on a, on the work? Yeah. I think that makes sense. Yeah. I think a lot of a lot of good stories in here around early stage, you know, businesses and companies. You know, whether you're you know law firm or any any kind of professional service, which is you know in the beginning, yeah, it's you need revenues, <laughs> right? So it's not even always profitable. It's not only not your strategic accounts, like it's just getting revenues in the door. And then you start to, you know, as you get that deal flow, you know, you start figuring out, all right, what do I really like to do? What can I really add value to? Where can I make significant profit? How can I differentiate myself? Where did you start to see, you know, the opportunities for you to kind of focus and zero in from a legal services practice? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, for me, I had, you know, previous to that, I was a corporate deal lawyer and, you know, uh, contracts deals. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. It's what I love to do. I had actually started my career doing some management side labor law work. I thought that's what I wanted to be coming out of law school. And I quickly found out, you know, I won't tell the whole story rather, but within the first year, I ended up doing deals. And I did, you know, I was on some big M&A deals and some uh, secondary, you know, public offerings, financing deals and leveraged buyouts. And I got so excited about that stuff. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. But, you know, like the firm I left represented, for example, GECC, General Electric Credit Corp, you know, and they did, you know, a hundred million dollar deal, you know. I mean, they weren't handing a deal like that to Corey Cuffer, who was working out of yeah. his studio apartment on the Upper East Side and renting a conference room by the hour down at 67 Wall Street. Yeah. That wasn't going to happen, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I knew that was the kind of work I wanted to do, and I built up to it. And I and you know, within a year and a half, frankly, I had. So you know, here's another lesson: within a year and a half, I had more business than I could personally handle. Yeah, good. But I did not have enough business for two people. But I still made the jump at that point and brought in. I joke that the the guy who became my first partner was the only only other guy stupid enough to leave a major <laughs> law firm job and not know where his next dollar was coming from and join me as a partner. So yeah. that's how. The yeah. truth was, the truth was, he was a guy that I that I had worked with previously. He was a litigator, and I was doing some lit- this kind of litigation. And I had, you know, and I was, you know, wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And I had built up enough work for about one and a half people. And I think, I mean, I, I was barely holding on with that. Yeah. And then. You know, the thing is, it's an example of and repeatedly where I think in business, you have to make a leap of faith. Yeah. Right. And my leap of faith was to bring in this partner who I handed off all of the litigation, all that stuff I didn't want to be doing. I literally, we just did a 50-50 partnership because frankly, you know, although I had built something, I hadn't built much, yeah. you know, there yeah. wasn't a lot of value there. I get it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I took a hit because, uh, and listen, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about, like I had left a job over six figures. I made, I netted $17,000 my first year. Yeah. I netted, I netted $36,000 my second year. I netted $78,000 my third year. Yeah. You notice I don't, I didn't forget those numbers. Yeah. Um, and by my fourth year, I was making more than I would have had, to, uh, you know, at the bigger firm and I never looked back. Yeah. But a year and a half in, you know, when I had made the, when I was still making seventeen thousand dollars, and one of the reasons why I only jumped to thirty eighth the next year or thirty sixth the next year instead of uh, more, was because I had brought in a partner and yeah. basically handed off half the firm to him. But I knew that, you know, sometimes you have to make a leap of faith to grow, and that's been a theme of my law firm and my other businesses throughout the rest of my time. Yeah. Is you know when is it time to make those leaps of faith? Yeah. Well, and it's I think it's always that calculation. You know, what is the calculus for figuring that out? I mean, there's always a sort of a short term loss to longer term gain, but really kind of figuring out what those are. And yeah, I mean, look, I, I very few people that I've spoken to that have left big firms to start their own companies uh, or left, you know, well-paying, stable jobs to start their own companies, you know, have made more money in year one or year two or three. You know, it usually takes three, four or five years. Now, though, the benefit is years six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 can reap huge rewards. Absolutely. But, you know, you've got to take that short term hit. And a part, part of it is, you know, do, doing the calculus. Part of it is adjusting your life to be able to run <laughs> on those lower numbers. But I think that's really what separates out you know, kind of the people who are, you know, cut from the cloth of the corporate environment versus really want to be entrepreneurs and really want to kind of strike out on their own. You know, so kudos to you and, you know, congratulations on the success for, for actually success, launching that and getting that practice going. So so ultimately, what was the practice that you or what area of, of law did you spend most of your career in as an attorney then? Yeah. So, I mean, mo- and it's still, you know, a big part of what, you know, mostly what we do now. I mean, I, I look at uh, strategy negotiating deals advice is the way I look at it. So, so we, we work so really with that corporate side. Yeah. The yeah. corporate side, we work with companies to help them grow and it's through contracts, deals of various types. And, uh, you know, we still do that now and we, and, and we work with the clients across industries. We have, you know, a bunch of financial services clients, but we also have tech and you name it, restaurant. I mean, I've done deals in every industry. 
Yeah. And uh, and that's mainly what I focus on. Now we do we also do the ancillary stuff around what businesses need. So if yeah. they need a, like a, you know a lease you know for their office space, we do that. We you know I have somebody who does trademark work, intellectual property work for them. We do anything that our business clients need, but we don't do any of the other stuff. Yeah, no, and I think that makes sense. I think that's pretty typical is, you know, a company has a core service offering that they market and they position themselves around. And then once they have clients, you know, they'll, they'll certainly service them in other ways. But I'm assuming you don't you don't go out with those services from a marketing point of view. It's just things that you provide because you know your clients need. That's right. So let's talk about the book. So talk to me about when did the book first come up with you? I mean, when did you first kind of think, oh, I should be thinking about or writing a book? Like, what was the impetus for you? Yeah, so. I mean, listen, one of the things I literally negotiate every day. Now, at some level, I say everybody negotiates every day because you negotiate with your significant yeah. other and your kids and your, but I mean, I negotiate professionally every day, yep. you know, because I always have a deal, a contract going on. I'm always doing something for a client. And over that time, I developed a, a philosophy and approach on the way I do it that's somewhat different. And it's much more, I mean, between that and some of the personal growth and business growth work I've done that focuses on the internal game, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, I'm a, uh, just to bring it back to philosophy, I, I do believe that the, the world is manifest from within, right? Yep. That we create everything, we attract everything, we, you know, uh, from within. And, I, and um, so my approach to negotiating is that way. Most of the negotiating training out there is very tactical. Yeah. You know, if they yeah. do this, then you do that, yeah. you know? And then there's counter tactics to the counter tactics, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And a lot of that stuff is frankly pretty manipulative and, yeah. and it doesn't work at a, I mean, you know, at, at some level it'll work, but at a, any kind of sophisticated level, it doesn't work. And then listen, there are some good tactical, uh, you know, uh, trainings and advice out there. I'm not saying tactics are bad, but fundamentally what I learned is if you go into a negotiation from a place of desperation or scarcity or fear or ego or, uh, you know, whatever, right, all that yeah. stuff that I don't care what tactics you put on top of that, you're not going to be successful. Yeah. So I I learned that if I didn't do, I mean, I, I started myself, like, when do I get triggered in a negotiation? And when you, if you get triggered, you get, you know, you're going to get thrown off and you're not going to get the best result. So I did the work myself and then I would, you know, coach clients through it because you know, sometimes I handle negotiations for the clients. Sometimes I'll, they'll be handling aspects of the negotiation. And I'll be behind the scenes yep. helping coach them and train them. And so these philosophies really developed. And, and frankly, uh, you know, it was sort of in the back of my mind, but at some point, you know, my wife, uh, some other clients of mine, business people were just encouraging me like, you know, you're like, you just get great results. You're so phenomenal about this. You should yeah. write a book. Yeah. You know, everybody says, everybody says you want, and we all say we want to write a book, but you know, it's a, it's a project. It's a commitment. Um, <laughs> yeah. But finally, you know, I was sort of on the verge and then my wife said something to me, which, uh, it sounds horrible, but she <laughs> was meant well. <laughs> She said, listen, the, you you are you have too much to offer here. You're too good at this. You cannot die with this information in, yeah. in you. I was like, oh, hey. <laughs> you can't take this to the grave. <laughs> Please. I was like, wait, I think I'm planning on being around for a while. Yeah, exactly. but, you know, yeah. okay. I get it. I get it. I think she meant it in a loving way. But yeah. She did. She totally did. So I like that idea that um, being told by the external world or kind of having this evidence presented to you from the external world that, look, you've got you've got something to offer, you know, a book about what you've learned around negotiating seems to be would be a great benefit to folks. Tell us about how like how did you decide what you were actually going to write about? Because I think it's easy. Uh, it's not necessarily easy to write a book. I think it's it's hard to write a good book. <laughs> yeah, it's still hard yes. to write bad books, but it's hard to write a good book. How did you go about really figuring out what this book was going to be about and who was going to be for, I guess? Like, what, what was your audience? Who did you want to write for? What did you want sure. to tell them? Yeah, I mean, so I had a head start in that I was already speaking, you know, so so I, I done a lot of speaking over the years. It sort of came organically at a law firm originally, and now I have actually a separate company that's a speaking and training company, and Got I'm it. a member of the uh, National Speakers Association, a professional member. But even back then, I was, I was, you know, I was speaking on it already. So I had a PowerPoint, I had an outline, I had, you know, and, and that's very different than a book, but it, but it actually basically gave me the first outline of the book. Yeah. Uh, so I really knew what I wanted to write about. Now, obviously how you make it into a book and how you flesh it out. And I, you know, and I work with a, a hybrid business publisher that had, you know, uh, co-writers and editors that helped mm -hmm. me, you know, with it. But, you know, to your point, the great thing about working with those kind of companies is that they move you along and it's a process and they try, you know, they make sure that you're going to get the book out. I actually had to slow the process because, listen, we've joked about this, right? Around EO, especially entrepreneurs yeah. organization, which we've both been a member of, right? Yeah. You know, there's this conversation that most business books should be an article. You know, <laughs> exactly. you know, they have an article worth of value and then they have another 150 pages. Yeah. yeah. And I was, you know, I was so intent 
that nobody could ever say that about my book. Yeah. That there was value through the entire thing. So frankly, I slowed the process with my publisher and did two major rewrites on the book. One, just you know, myself, you know, when I was just I really wanted it to be great, and I also came up with some new stuff that I want to put in. And then I had some people read the book. I had you know seven or eight people who agreed to read it and give me input. And you know, I heard things like we want more stories, you know, and that kind of stuff. So then I did another rewrite that not only that incorporated their information and also my, you know, additional changes. So, you know, it, it took a, a year and a half of time to, yeah. to get it done and get it to the point where I'd be happy with it and where I really thought it provided value from page one to, to the last page. Yeah. I, and I like that idea that it takes a couple of rewrites. You know, the, the first the first version is not the final one and getting some feedback and really taking some time to think about it. I think that oftentimes is a big difference between, you know, books that really resonate, you know, and, and have some depth and the ones that, yeah, really, really should just be, you know, a thousand word article <laughs> you know, that I don't really need to read, you know, hundred. 50 pages. So let's talk about the content a little bit. Let's give some sort of takeaways from the listeners here. So, you know, for folks that are, and I think, you know, the, the service space is fascinating for me from a negotiating point of view, because many times it, it falls into this category of what I call kind of relationship negotiating, right? You're not, it's not an individual transaction. I'm not buying a car. Like I'm negotiating with folks that I may have an ongoing relationship, may do several deals with, I may have ongoing contracts, you know, things like that. So, and that's a little more complicated or at least a little more multifaceted kind of negotiation. So what are some typical ways, I guess, maybe start with some of the things that you see people do doing wrong or, or ways in which negotiations fail, ways in which people misstep in negotiation. What are the things that you feel are common out there? Yeah, so I'm going to um, start at a very basic level, which is that most people have a, a framework that they're looking to win in negotiation, mm, right? Interesting. Uh, and even the concept of win-win, which, you know, came in, you know, years ago yeah. from Bill Urie and his team and yeah. getting TS and that kind of stuff, which, which is great, I think is not problematic the way they wrote it, but it's problematic the way people apply because I think people, the minute they get the concept of win in their mind, their ego yeah. gets engaged, et cetera. And what I talk about is that the objective of a negotiation should not be to win it. It should be to achieve your objectives. In fact, I often will allow the other side to feel like they've won because I have no ego in it yeah. as long as I've achieved all my objectives. So, you know, you <laughs> want to switch that. What you said about, you know, in business, these are often ongoing relationships. You're negotiating with, you know, clients and vendors and employees and business partners, whatever, who you can have an ongoing relationship with. You have to remember the negotiation is only a small part of the entire relationship. Yeah. And if you, even if you have the leverage and you crush somebody, that, relationship's not going to work out. They're going to yeah. be looking to get get it back in some way. Yeah, you're going to pay for it <laughs> one way or another. One right. way or another. So that's that's the first thing to keep in mind. The other couple, of, I mean, my core framework for authentic negotiating is clarity. It's CDE. The first one, the C is clarity. Okay. Right? And people, this is the thing. I do multi-million dollar negotiations, you know, from small to very big, you know, and, and all along the spectrum, people go into those negotiations without close to the level of clarity that you should have on exactly what you want, what you don't want. So talk to me more about clarity. When, when, when you say being clear or getting, getting clear on these, what, what is it that we're trying to get clear on before we go into the negotiation? Yeah, I want to get clear on, on truly, well, you know, why are you even in the negotiation? And then yeah. what do you want to get out of it, right? Because people get so engaged and off track. So, you know, it takes a deep inquiry. Like if, if you're looking to buy a company or sell your company, for example, or even you're looking to bring in a partner, you're looking at, you know, even if it's just doing a, uh, some sort of marketing, you know, contract with somebody, yeah. the, it's so easy to, jump into that and just try to negotiate the terms and you think it would, but you haven't spent a lot of time digging deep on really why am I selling my company, right? And I've yeah. seen deals fall apart because the other side isn't able to answer that why because the person isn't even clear on that why, yeah. right? And I've solved deals, for example, where where sellers, where the deal looked like it was dying and you couldn't figure out why, like the, the money seemed right, the structure seemed right. And you figure out that by letting uh, the guy continue to come into his office because you know, what he didn't realize is that he needs to feel useful yeah. still yeah. or that he doesn't want to be at home with his spouse <laughs> you know, exactly. or whatever, okay, all the time. And if you don't solve for that, so, you know, so the why, you know, uh, unless you get clarity on the objectives and he's not going to, you know, it's not automatic to sit down and say one of my objectives is that I still need to feel useful, right? Yeah. You yeah. know, that's not like what's going to automatically come. But but often you have to get there to try to figure out how to get a deal done and to have them really work. Yeah. Um, so that's the clarity piece. The other piece of clarity is what I call true bottom line. And that is I ask people all the time, hey, what do you want to let's let's take a sale of a company situation. How, how much do you want for your company? Oh, I'd love to get $10 million for it. OK, you know, or one million or whatever. Use yep. whatever scale you want, $100,000, but yeah. $10 million for it. OK, what's you know, that's your ideal. What's your bottom line? Uh, uh, Okay, nine million five hundred thousand. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. And they pull that out of the air, but they don't. So I said, uh, okay, so let's assume all of the other significant terms of the deal, because in addition to price, the structure, maybe you want key employees to stay on the payment terms, you know, whatever. Maybe you want the names to spy, whatever your objectives are, whatever your major ones are. Let's yeah. say you achieve every single one, every, all of the other material things, important things to you, you get 100%. Yeah. But instead of 9.5 million, they offer you 9 million. Four hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars ninety nine cents. Do you yeah. take the deal? And everybody's reaction, of course, is yeah, it's just a penny, yeah. Corey. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What about a penny less than that? Yeah. A penny less than that. <laughs> a penny less than that. Yeah. You end up at zero. Yeah. So there's literally got to be a number, that, a penny less than, yeah. right? Or if you know it's delivery of the goods, a, you know, a date, not a day more than a not a day less than. And this isn't coming from a place of rigidity. It, yeah. It's coming from a place of clarity on really, truly what your bottom line is. And almost nobody does the internal work to get that level of clarity. And that's what I push people to do because, one, it makes the decisions during the negotiation easy. It becomes yeah. binary, right? Yeah. Number yeah. two, you design your entire negotiating strategy around you need to know the bottom line. If the yeah. bottom line is really you know, $8.7 million and not $9.5, you're probably going to start the negotiations in a different place. Yeah. So it's crucial to know. So that's the clarity piece. Yeah. And I imagine it's it's really important or helpful to do that before you get into the throes of negotiating. I mean, like try, trying yeah, to trying to do that when things are heated and you've time pressure and you got to cut the deal in the next five minutes, you know, that then it's almost impossible to get that kind of clarity. When So so doing that before, it seems like a pretty important step. It's the reason why it's CDE, the C comes first, yeah. because the clarity has to come first. The D is detachment, which is how do you stay detached to the outcome, right? So Ooh, ultimately, yeah. you, can, uh, you know, if you and I are negotiating a deal, I should have a preference we get the deal done because why am I wasting my time talking to you if I don't have a preference? Yeah. But ultimately, I should be equally okay if we get a deal done or we don't, right? Because yeah. it either meets my criteria that I've gotten clarity on, my objectives I got clarity on, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it doesn't mean that Bruce Eckfeld's a bad guy or you're a jerk or you're a, you know, whatever. It just means your objectives and my objectives don't meet right now. We're not, we won't do a deal right now. Maybe we'll do something in the future. Maybe we won't. So you need that detachment and that's really hard. So how do you get that? I mean, I guess my first thought is that it's, it's, Having some kind of vision of an alternative outcome that doesn't include the deal, that's okay. Like it's, I think it's hard to go into these deals if your only vision for the future is the deal being done, because then you're left with you know uncertainty and vagueness and you know you know vulnerability, right? So how how do you really get that level of detachment? What's the process? Yeah, so I think I think listen, practically looking at and saying, hey, you know, what are all the alternatives? But listen, sometimes sometimes the alternative is just not doing a deal right now, right? And so I think it ultimately comes down to trust. And I think if you were to do that work to get that level of clarity, that my fundamental philosophy is that if you're not getting what you need, then you just trust that it's not meant to be. And I believe that, and you know, and I'm not like I, I do believe that there are other opportunities that will show up if you uh, you may not be able to see them right now. But the problem is if you fill your time, energy, space, you know, whatever you want to call it. With something that's not ideal, you don't leave room for something better to show up. Yeah. So you need to trust in that. And then listen, there are practical ways. I mean, everybody does it differently. I always ask people, hey, what is it that you do in life when you're sort of, you know, stressed or thrown off or whatever that gets you calm? Some people it's meditating. Some people go out for a run. Some people bounce things off their friends. Some people, you know, whatever. I say, okay, start there. Let's do that, you know, and in a, you know, prior to a negotiation to get your head clear. And then I do have a tool in the book that we probably don't have time to go into in detail, but if people read the book, there's something called a CPR, which is context, purpose, and results. And it's a framework that helps people not only get clear, but also stay detached from the outcome. Yeah, excellent. So I get clarity, I get detachment. So the third one, E was equilibrium? Did I get equilibrium. That right? Yeah, exactly. so so equilibrium, talk to me about that. So th that is, I mean, you, you sort of alluded to it before you say, hey, you know, you gotta get the clarity before you're in the heat of the negotiation, yeah. right? So, you know, you've gotten your clarity, you go into the negotiations, attached from the outcome, but then how do you maintain your equilibrium? You're in the heat of the negotiation. Somebody tells you your company's not worth half that, or, <laughs> you know, or they pull some, some crazy tactic on yeah. you, or they, yeah. you know, or, you know, they, whatever, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, listen, we're human. We're not robots. We get triggered sometimes. We get upset. We get fearful. We get, you know, our ego comes up. So how do we, in the moment, during the negotiation, keep that equilibrium and not get thrown off? Because the bottom line is, if you're in any kind of, any of those emotions, right? If you're triggered in any way, then you're not at your best, right? You're not able to listen, you're not able to think straight, you're not able to be creative, and you know, you're at a disadvantage. 
So one of the things that that CPR tool does that's in the book is I have people not only write that thing out, but because it's your context, it's your purpose for the negotiation, all the results you want, and, and, they actually, and people actually carry it with them. So one tool is, hey, take a break, right? You know, you can, yeah. you can take a break, say, hey, listen, I got to go to the restroom. Let's take a lunch break. Let's give you, reconvene later. So first of all, you can just breathe, you can take a walk, et cetera, but you can also reconnect to your CPR tool to get clear and, and then remember, because here's the thing, if you let your, it's great, you got clarity, it's great you're detached coming in, but if you let your equilibrium get thrown off, you lose your detachment and you lose your connection to your clarity and it all goes out the window. Yeah. So you got to be able to keep that, that evenness, that centeredness, that connection to your objectives and not be thrown off there in the negotiation. Yeah, uh, it's fascinating. I, I I realize one of my tricks or one of the one of my indicators that I can that I kind of pay attention to during these kind of conversations is my peripheral vision. Like I notice that when when I start to lose my peripheral vision, it means that I'm being triggered, I, and sometimes I don't even realize it. And, and, but that's my cue. You know, it's like hey, you know, I got to take a break or I got to start breathing. I got to slow things down because if that if I start getting that tunnel vision, I know that I'm not at my best. I know I'm not really processing what's happening or really considering the options. I'm going to start reacting to things, and that's not often not does not often lead to the best outcomes. That's brilliant. You know, the book is great. And, you know, I've gone through it. Uh, there's a lot of great tools. There's a lot of great stories. If people want to find out more about you, about the book, what's the best way to get that information? Yeah. So one of the hubs they can go to is just coreycupfer.com. That's C-O-R-E-Y-K-U-P-F-E-R.com. On there, there's a few things. One, they'll be able to, you know, get some of my content, et cetera. There's uh, links to the book, which they can get on Amazon or, you know, bondsandnoble.com or whatever. They can link through there. There's also, by the way, a, an authentic negotiation success quiz that they can take 10 questions to see how, how much of an authentic negotiator they are. And soon to be, I have a podcast launching in February of yeah. 2019. Probably be right around the right time. So it's okay. good timing. Which is called the Fueling Deals Podcast. And there'll be a page up there soon on uh, on that as well. So CoreyCuffer.com is a good hub. The law firm is CuffferLaw.com. And then I'm at Corey Cuffer on all the social media channels, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Twitter. Perfect. And I'll, I'll have links to all those in the show notes. And uh, you, you send me the link to the podcast when it goes live. I'll include that as well. So people Absolutely. can click through and get all that information. Corey, this has been a pleasure. I've learned a lot. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. Great to be with you, Bruce. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com newsletter.